Words at War. You folks at home probably read about the trial in the papers. It must have sounded pretty terrible. An officer of the American Air Corps on trial for robbing Italian peasants. Since it was a military matter, I don't suppose the papers over here ever carried a follow-up story on it. Anyhow, now that I'm back on furlough, I'd like very much to tell you the real story of Lieutenant Eddie Amato's court-martial. What lay behind it? How it finally turned out? I know the story at first hand. I was flight surgeon of Eddie's squadron. The National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with the Council on Books and Wartime, presents another program in the series Words at War. All of us on Words at War are more than a little proud that this week our program has been honored by a special citation from Variety, the trade paper of show business. In awarding this citation, Variety characterized Words at War as one of the most outstanding programs in current radio. Thank you, Variety. Tonight, it's Eliot Arnold's novel of democracy in war-torn Italy. Tomorrow, we'll see. In February of that year, our B-24 squadron was transferred from North Africa to an air base near Foggia, Italy. I remember the day we landed. The rain was coming down in hatfuls, and the boys were pretty disappointed in their first glimpse of the country. So, this is sunny Italy. Give me Chicago any day, Doc. I see what you mean, Kelly. No chamber of commerce here, huh? Hey, Eddie, <laughs> you didn't tell us about this. Why don't you warn us? Well, look, Kelly, all I know about this place is what my father used to tell me. He was born here, not me. Now, you have some relatives near here, haven't you, Eddie? Yeah, yeah. An uncle of mine's got a farm somewhere around Foggia. And who cares about your uncles? Haven't you got any good-looking cousins? Female cousin? <laughs> oh, listen to him, will you, Doc Kelly? You talk like a man with a paper tongue. It turned out that Eddie's uncle had a farm just a few miles from the base. So after we got settled, Eddie and I piled into a jeep and drove over there. The old man was polite, but reserved. I am uh, Gennaro Amato. I am glad to welcome the son of my dead brother. Come into the house. Gennaro's son, Ricardo, had been an officer in the Italian army. He wasn't inclined to be as polite as his father. When Eddie told him that he was a bombardier, Ricardo said, Ah, then I must congratulate you, cousin. The bombing of Foggia was very well done. It was only by mere chance that you find us alive and well. Eddie tried to explain that Foggia had been bombed long before we came there. But it didn't help to take the chill out of the atmosphere. Meanwhile, Gennaro had sent for his neighbors to come over and meet his American nephew. Among them were the Sorvinos and their daughter, Nina. There seemed to be some understanding between this lovely young girl and Ricardo. That liked the idea of playing host to American officers. Nina, come. You must sing for our guests. Oh, very well. What shall I sing, Ricardo? Sing Lily Marley. Oh, Ricardo. The American lieutenant... Has no objection? No, why, of course not. Why should I object, Signorina? The song, Lily Marlene, it was sung by the Germans in North Africa and by the Italian army also. Well, everybody's singing it now. I'd like to hear you sing it. Tutte le sere sotto quel fanal Resso la caserma di stavola ad aspettar Anche stasera aspetta I felt rather sorry for Eddie right then. He'd been so eager to meet his relatives. And the actual welcome was pretty disheartening. There was more to it than the fact that he was an American officer. Eddie discovered that when his uncle took him outside to show him the farm. Say, uncle, that girl, Nina, she, uh, she appears to dislike me. Well, uh, Sorvino's had a son. He was killed by the Americans in North Africa. Oh, oh, I see. 
Is, uh, is she in love with Ricardo? I do not know for sure. Oh, Ricardo is with, with her brother in North Africa. Whether this is love or just remembering her brother, I, I do not know. Oh. She, uh, she's very beautiful. Yes, she is. Well, Eduardo, what do you think of this farm? Oh, oh, it's a fine place, Uncle. You should be proud to own it. I do not own it. Oh, no, I, uh, I thought you did. This land, this house, this farm is not mine. It belongs to you. What? Your father left it in my care when he went to America. Now that he's dead, what was his becomes yours. Well, I, I, I don't know what to say. Nevertheless, the farm is yours. Oh, but, Uncle, I can't come along and take what you've worked for so many years. I have my own farm in Long Island, a good farm. Well, at any rate, it's not a matter to be decided now. That was how the legend of Eddie Amato began with this question of the ownership of the farm. Under the Germans, the people had grown used to ruthless ways of a conquering army. It seemed unbelievable to Gennaro that Eddie should hesitate to accept property which was rightfully his. Yes, Eddie Amato was definitely something new in the way of conquerors. Imagine the Germans making a request like this. Uncle, if I won't be in the way, I'd like to help with the work here. You, you wish to help, to work? Uh -huh. You see, I'm a farmer, Uncle. I'd, I'd be very happy to work here. Oh, very well. I, I plan to begin the plowing in a few days. Good. I'll be here. Uh, say, uh, Uncle, is is Nina betrothed to Ricardo? Uh, no. I, uh, I don't wish to provoke him. I know that Ricardo doesn't like me. Well, it is necessary to understand this about Ricardo. From the time of his birth, he has been exposed to certain things. It is not possible for him to discard these things at once. Of course. Of course, Uncle, I, I understand. They were being polite, of course. Ricardo's hatred of Eddie was of the bitterest kind, on a double score. First, because he was an American officer, and then because Eddie might accept the farm and deprive Ricardo of a potential legacy. Cousin Ricardo poured out his bitterness to Nina. But, Ricardo, the lieutenant has not said that you will accept the farm. I mean, that cannot be that you believe this. Why, there's nothing but a trick to win the confidence of fools like my father. Later, when this trust has been won, the Americans will probably seize all the farms here. Ricardo, no. Remember this, Nina. These are the same ones who killed your brother. You must not trust them. Yes, you, you are right, Ricardo. I must not forget this. As for me, I can no longer stand the sight of these idiots groveling before the American. Well, what will you do? There are Italian forces still fighting with the Germans in the north. I go to join them. And when I return, I shall be as a hero. It was obvious to Eddie that Ricardo had left because of him. And he felt very badly about it. But it did make things easier for him at Gennaro's house. And eventually at the Sorvinos, too. But it was no easy matter to break through the hardness that Nina had thrown around herself. Nina, I know how you feel about your brother's death, but you must realize that it's a thing of war. You shouldn't hold it against me. Why do you come into my father's house? What do you do here? Well, I... Don't ask me to explain. Why does one wish to see another? There can be many reasons... If you don't want to see me, Nina, I won't come here. It, it is easy to be confused. You do not think one thing and say another? No, Nina. Believe me. Nina's suspicion were echoed in the minds of many of these people. And Eddie began to break them down with understanding and generosity and kindness. He did it in a dozen different ways. And each of these things added new wonder to the legend that was spreading over the countryside. Look, Eduardo, look. The blade of the plow has broken. There is no place to get it repaired now. Hmm. Split right through. 
What will I do? If I cannot get a plate repair, I, I must wait and borrow a plow from the others. Then we'll be too late for the planting. Yes, yes. I think I can get this fixed, Uncle. There's a welding shop at the airfield. Will they do this? Your army? Our conquerors? <laughs> Now, here's the deal, fellas. I'd, I'd like as many of you as are willing to come out to the farm and lend a hand. The exercise will be good for you, no kidding. And at the same time, you'll be doing my uncle a favor he'll never forget. Okay, okay. okay. So, I'm in a trouble, Eduardo. Bad trouble. Well, what is it, Cesaro? There's an evil blight on my vines. It eats through my leaves like a hungry thing. Some of the others say I should... Burn it down in my vineyard. Burn it down? No, no, that's ridiculous. Perhaps I can get something for you to cure the vines. Let's see, there may be something I can get from the army. If not, I could cable to the Secretary of Agriculture in Washington. The Secretary of Agriculture? Mm -hmm. You had a personal relationship with him? I have heard how you fixed Piccillo's vines... It was very good of you, Eduardo. Oh, it was nothing, Nina. It was fortunate I was able to get the chemical. Uh, did did you know that my cousin Ricardo has come back? Yes, I I know. He, he could not get through to the German lines. Do you care that he's back? I... I do not think Ricardo and I were such good friends as we thought. That is what you want to know. Is it not? Eduardo, these men wish to ask a question of your government. I told them you would answer it. Well, I will answer it if I can, Cesaro. What is it? It is the question of the crops. In the previous years, the proceeds of our labor on the land were denied to us. We were told by the Germans that our, our crops were needed to feed their army. Now there is a new army here, the Americans, your army. We would like to know this. What is the attitude of the American army on this subject? I, I don't think any of you need have any fear on that subject. The army of the United States provides its own food. Is this then a promise? Yes, Cesaro. It's a promise. Can you visualize the wonder in the eyes of these peasants? An officer of a conquering army came among them, refused to take advantage of them, and went out of his way to help them at every turn. And if there was any single thing that clinched their admiration for Eddie, it was the shortwave broadcast. The whole thing came up in the course of a conversation with Nina's father. He was questioning Eddie about the condition of Italians in America. Is not the government of the United States hateful, violent toward the Italians in America? <laughs> no. No, Signor Savino. Look, I'm, I'm of Italian blood and I'm an officer in the American army. Why, the mayor of New York City is of Italian descent. Ah. Uh -huh. Was not the same mayor thrown into jail and then executed? What? Where'd you hear that? It was so announced by the old government here. Well, of all... Tell me, tell me, do all the people here think as you do that the mayor of New York was killed? Certainly. Huh. Believe me, Senor Savino, it, it, it's nothing but a lie. I'll prove it to you. How can this be proved? Hmm? Well, uh, I, I, I don't know at this moment. But I'll find a way to prove it. <laughs> You see, Doc... Yes, Eddie? I've told these people a lot of things about America. But if they believe this stuff about the mayor, why, they probably think I'm full of baloney about all the rest. Well, how about this? Why not let them listen to him? Listen to him? Are you nuts, Doc? How? Well, I understand the mayor broadcasts over shortwave every Sunday. He does? Uh-huh. See, that's a terrific idea, Doc. Look, we'll borrow a radio and take it out to Savino's next Sunday. He can pass the word around to all the farmers. They can hear the mayor for themselves. Well, the news of the coming broadcast spread all right, like a prairie fire. 
That Sunday night, there must have been at least 500 farmers gathered in Savino's front yard. Up on the porch, Eddie paced back and forth. Well, Kelly and I fiddled with the radio. Eddie was as jittery as, as a bombardier before a flight. Doc, Doc, suppose just tonight he doesn't speak or the transmission's bad. <laughs> this is the voice of... A is that it, Doc? Is that it? Uh -huh, the 25-meter band. The mayor ought to be on in a few seconds. Hey, you better say something to the crowd. Uh, no, say something. Sure, you know. Introduce it. Well, well okay, here goes. Uh, attention, everybody. In just a few moments, we'll hear the voice of the mayor of New York City. I, I, I don't know what this man will say. The thing I do know is this. He's of Italian blood. He's still mayor of the largest city in America. And he speaks his mind as he pleases. Such as the United States. Now, Mayor LaGuardia. This is your friend, LaGuardia speaking. To the courageous people of occupied Italy, I should like to send our greetings once again. Continue the faces of the peasants were filled with wonder. As the mayor talked on, heads began to nod gravely. Eyes began to shine. As the mayor closed his talk, there was a restless stirring in the crowd as they anticipated the finish. to worry about in other parts of Europe. The liberation of all of Italy is not far away. This is your friend, LaGuardia, who has spoken to you. Courage forward. You see, you don't generally think of ideas in the abstract. You identify them with people. And when these farmers thought of democracy in America, they thought of Eddie Amato. Now, maybe that sounds a little pompous, but it was really the way they felt. If they didn't, they would never have sought Eddie's opinion about the marketing of the crops. To them, it was as crucial as life and death. Eduardo, as you have promised... We are now permitted by the American to sell our crops wherever we please. Uh huh. But when we go to marketplace, we find the dealers are all agree on a certain low price, half what the crops are worth. Well, then we ask ourselves, how are we better off than before? It, it was thought by these men uh, that uh, perhaps you could help us, as you have in other ways. Told them you would help us, Eduardo. Well, uh, to, to investigate this organization that appears to be keeping the prices down is beyond my abilities. There's, there's probably some agency, some government agency, which could help you. It seems to me that the only way, the only way to fight an organization of buyers is with an organization of sellers. Well, how you mean, Eduardo? Well, it, it's this, Uncle. Together, you may not even have to deal with the buyers in the market. Why not sell directly to the retail stores in the town? Let's take a vote on the matter then. All those who wish the plan to be investigated, say so. Yes. yes. There was much enthusiastic discussion, and finally Eddie's plan was approved by all. Gennaro and some of the others went beforehand to the stores in the towns and made contracts with the storekeepers. On the morning of the day on which the produce was to be sold, the wagons of the farmers formed a long procession on the road. It was like a holiday with Sunday clothes and flowers and silver harnesses. When they reached the first town, Eddie arose in his wagon and addressed the people. Uh, listen, everyone, listen. Listen. My uncle, Gennaro Amato, has suggested that I take charge of the money we receive from the storekeepers. Then I will divide it among you tomorrow. Is that satisfactory? All right, then. Let's go. The day was unbelievably successful. And by evening, every last vegetable had been sold at a good price. Eddie and Nina celebrated the day by going to the opera in Bari. Then she and Eddie drove slowly home in the wagon. It's been a long day, Nina. Long and happy, Eduardo. 
There has never been such a day for any of us. I'm glad. I was a little worried it might not work out. No one, Eduardo. No one has ever so concerned himself for them. They will not forget it. Well, they'll be even happier when I divide this money. Why, I, I must have several hundred thousand lira. How much is that in, in your money? Well, uh, let's see. A lira is now worth a penny. See? Mm, there must be uh, oh, about three thousand dollars. Oh. Whoa! Well, uh, here we are. Uh, wait a minute, Nina. I'll help you down. All right. Come on. There we are. Nina, darling. Eduardo. Oh, Nina. Oh, Eduardo. Now you must go and get some rest. Oh, I cannot wait to see their faces when you divide the money. Eddie said that he left Nina at one o'clock in the morning. It was four hours later when he came into my quarters and wakened me. His face was white and he was trembling all over. Doc, Doc, something terrible's happened. What uh, was it, Eddie? Doc, Dr. Doe, I was holding for the pharmacy. It's gone. I, I lost it. Or somebody stole it or something. What? I've been laying out there on the road since one o'clock. Somebody conked me on the head or something fell on me. I, I don't know, but when I came to, the money was gone. What am I going to do, Doc? What will I tell those farmers? <laughs> I don't know where he did get the guts to face those people the next day. It was brutal. The worst part of it was that none of them said a word. They just accepted it the way they had been accepting treachery for years. Gennaro refused to look at Eddie. Uncle, look at me. Do, do you believe that I've stolen the money? I... I... I do not make me answer. Please, all of you. You must believe me. Look. Look at the back of my head. Signor Savino, look. This is where I was struck. Cesaro, look. You, you can see the sign of the blow. Look. Look, Uncle. Please. You, you can't believe that I did this. The boy was crushed completely. When he wasn't flying, he refused to move outside his tent. He imagined that everyone would point him out as a thief. Of course, the fellows all believed Eddie's story. Or tried to. But they all admitted that he was in a bad spot. A court-martial proceeds on fact, not faith. Kelly frantically laid down a barrage of potential suspects. Hey, take that no good cousin of his, for example, Doc. That guy'd give his right arm to turn these people against Eddie. Why don't we sweat it out of them? Why don't we Kelly, get them to please, clean Please, don't you see what that would look like? It's just what their own black shirts would do. And what about that damn Nina? She was the last one. Are you one? kidding? She's in love with Eddie. How do you know she is? Because she says so? You remember how she hated all of us when we first came here? How do you know she hasn't just been playing up to Eddie just to frame him like this? Kelly, I know you want to help him, but this... All right, then. What about the old man himself? His uncle? That whole business about the farm belonging to Eddie. Wouldn't that be a sweet way to solve the problem? <laughs> Kelly was just sounding off. There wasn't a shred of proof in Eddie's defense, and the court-martial was instituted at once. The people were amazed at the very fact of the trial. Here the Americans were trying one of their own officers for robbing the peasants, and then to top it off, they summoned the peasants themselves as witnesses. I was called last as the doctor who had examined Eddie's bruise. I hated to give that testimony, but there was nothing else I could do. Captain... Can you state authoritatively that the blow is delivered by an outside force? No, I cannot. Thank you, Captain. Your witness, Major. Captain, is it possible to so deliver a blow to the head that the victim will be rendered unconscious and yet not to break the skin of the scalp? Objection, Your Honor. Incompetent, irrelevant, and immaterial. Uh, what is the line of argument the defense is attempting here? If the court please, I will try to show that the injury sustained by the defendant could have been delivered by an assailant. After that, I hope to show that this type of attack is known to have been a part of the training of the black shirts. Uh, go on, Major. Well, there are many black shirts in the neighborhood, aren't there? Former black shirts? Yes, it was a weak defense. We knew it. Everyone knew it. It was just about then that a man rose in the courtroom. 
went over to Gennaro and whispered in his ear. It was Dino, a little Italian who worked in the officer's quarters at the field. Gennaro got up suddenly and both of them left. Eddie was asked if he wished to make a final statement. He came slowly toward the front of the courtroom and stood there for a moment. I... I don't know what more I can say. In spite of what's happened, I'd... I'd like all these people to know that I don't hold anything against them. I hope they got to understand American things better because of me. I ought to say this, maybe. I wouldn't... Don't you see, I wouldn't let these people down like that. That's all, sir. Your Honor! Your Honor! Now, what on earth is this? Gennaro Amato. Who is this man with you? Your Honor, he's a former black shirt. It is my son, Ricardo Amato. Gennaro took the stand. With tears of shame in his eyes, the old man told how Dino had been invited by Ricardo to join him in another attempt to reach the Germans in the north. Ricardo had offered him huge sums of money for the care of his family. But Dino had no desire to accept the invitation. Your Honor, I was anxious to know the source of this money. My wife, she knew where Ricardo was hiding. Now, I have brought a son of mine here. He will tell you the truth you seek. He will tell you it was he who stole the money, not my American nephew. That's the story of how American democracy came to one little section of Italy. Democracy in the shape of a decent, honest kid from a truck farm in Long Island. I'd like to be able to give you a rousing end to the story, to tell you that Eddie and Nina were married and lived happily ever after. But that's not the end. Eddie is now in the Pacific, continuing to fight a war. And Nina is waiting for him in Italy. Please, God, the two will meet again. In any case, Eddie Amato will never be forgotten in one corner of Italy. He'll live, if only as a legend, as eternal proof that democracy is something more than a political concept. As proof that this overused word is nothing more or less than a man's decency to his fellow men. Tonight on Words at War, we've brought you a dramatization of Elliot Arnold's novel about democracy in war-torn Italy, entitled Tomorrow Will Sing. The radio play was written by Edward Jurist. Eddie Amato was played by Larry Haynes, Nina by Bryna Rayburn, Gennaro by Lou Soren, and Doc by Joseph Curtin. Mayor LaGuardia was impersonated. The music was arranged and played by William Meader, production Garnet Garrison. Next week, Words at War will present the radio dramatization of Banshee Harvest by James Phelan. This series of programs is brought to you in cooperation with the Council on Books in Wartime by the National Broadcasting Company and the independent radio stations associated with the NBC network. This is the National Broadcasting.